Representation theory of finite groups, lecture 10, induction and restriction. Let us start with a brief description of our setup. We consider a finite group G and the corresponding category G mode of all finite dimensional G modules over the field C of complex numbers. So our aim for this lecture is to develop some techniques to construct new G modules. The idea is to reduce the problem to some subgroup of G. So let H be a subgroup of G. Let V be an H module. So the question is, can one extend the H module structure on V to a G module structure, either on V or on something bigger that contains V? In this lecture, we will give a universal answer to this question. We will provide a construction how to extend a module over a subgroup to a module over a group. But before we can do that, we need to take a look at what happens in the opposite direction. So let us talk about the restriction. So let H be a subgroup of G. Then every G module is an H module by forgetting the action of all elements which are not in H. Also, every homomorphism of G modules is automatically a homomorphism of H modules for this restricted action. So hence, the restriction to H defines a functor from G mod to H mod. So we will denote this functor by restriction from G to H. And directly from the definition, since the restriction functor doesn't change the underlying vector space, this functor is exact. So if you have an exact sequence of G modules, it's exactly the same sequence with the same morphisms, which is a sequence of restricted H modules. And so if the original sequence is exact, the outcome will also be exact. For this, it is very important that the group G and any subgroup H have the same identity element. This restriction functor can be described in many different ways. Consider the associative algebra A, which is a group algebra of the group G. Then the identity functor on A mode is isomorphic to the functor of tensoring with the regular AA by module A. Consider the associative algebra B, which is a group algebra of H. Then this algebra is a unital subalgebra of A, and we can view the regular AA by module A as a BA by module, where the left action of B is given by restricting the A action to B. And then it is easy to see that the restriction from G to H is isomorphic to the functor of tensoring with this BA by module A. Alternatively, the identity and the functor on A mod is isomorphic to taking homomorphisms from the regular AA by module A to anything. And we can view the regular AA by module A also as an AB by module, where now the right action of B is given by restricting the action from A to B. And similarly, it is easy to see that the restriction functor is isomorphic to the functor of taking homomorphisms from this AB by module A to something. So we will not use these alternative descriptions directly, but they are quite helpful if one wants to understand the intuition behind what we are doing. So let us describe basic properties of the restriction. Basic property number one, let H be a subgroup of G and K be a subgroup of H. Then the restriction from G to K is equal to first the restriction from G to H, followed by the restriction from H to K. So this follows directly from the fact that forgetting first all elements in G outside H, and then all elements in H outside K, is the same as forgetting all elements outside K in G in one go. 
To formulate basic property two, let us for the moment use the notation V and then upper G to specify that V is a G module. So basic property two, restricting the trivial G module from G to H gives the trivial H module. So this follows directly from the definitions. Remark, clearly restriction sends one-dimensional G modules to one-dimensional H modules. And for this particular case, it in particular sends simple G modules to simple H modules. However, in general, this general claim is not true. Quite often, restrictions from G to H send simple G modules to non-simple H modules. Basic property three, Restricting from G to H the regular representation of G gives a direct sum of copies of the regular representation of H, and the number of summons is exactly the index of H in G. In other words, the cardinality of G divided by the cardinality of H. To prove this, let us decompose G into a disjoint union of H cosets. So G, so this should be G on the left-hand side, is equal to H times G1, union with H times G2, and so on, union with H times G, with the index, the index of H and G. For I, from 1 to the cardinality of G divided by the cardinality of H, let us denote by VI the subspace of the regular G module which is spanned by the elements of the corresponding coset H times GI. So from this definition, we clearly have that the regular G module CG is isomorphic as a vector space to V1 plus V2 plus and so on. And since each H GI is an H coset, so in particular it is stable with respect to the left multiplication with elements in H, it follows that each VI is an H module. Then it is easy to see that sending an element H in H to the element HGI in VI defines an isomorphism from the regular H module C of H to VI. And this proves our claim. Let us consider one example of a restriction. So let us consider the subgroup Sn minus one of the symmetric group Sn, defined as the collection of all elements in Sn, which fix the last element n. So Sn minus one consists of all permutation of n elements where the last element is fixed. Let us denote by Nn the natural Sn module. So let us try to compute the restriction of this natural Sn module to Sn minus one. Denote by V the subspace of Nn, which is generated by the elements one, two, and so on, N minus one. Clearly, V is an Sn minus one submodule, which is isomorphic to the natural module for Sn minus one. Let us denote by W the subspace of Nn generated by N. Then, of course, directly from the definition, the natural module Nn is isomorphic to V direct sum with W. And also by definition, any element in Sn minus 1 fixes the generating element W of W. So this means that the restriction from Sn to Sn minus one of the natural Sn module Nn is isomorphic now as Sn minus one module to N N minus one direct sum with a trivial Sn minus one module. We know that the natural module over Sn minus one is isomorphic to the trivial module direct sum with the module Carly S n minus one comma one. So the answer to our question, the restriction from Sn to Sn minus one of the natural Sn module Nn is isomorphic as an Sn minus one module 
to the direct sum of two copies of the trivial module and the module curly S with an upper index n minus 2 comma 1. Now let us make a short segue to induction. As we have seen, the restriction functor from G mod to H mod can be described as the functor of taking homomorphisms from the regular CGCG by module, considered as a CGCH by module by restriction, to blank. So by abstract nonsense, taking such homomorphisms has a left adjoint given by tensoring with this by module. So tensoring with the CGCH by module CG is a functor from H mod to G mod. And in the setup of representation series of finite groups, this functor has a very transparent explicit description, which we will give in this lecture. And in the next lecture, we will prove that this explicit description really provides an adjoint to the restriction functor. So let us now describe a setup for induction. So G is a finite group and H is a subgroup of G. We denote by M the index of H in G, which means the cardinality of G divided by the cardinality of H. Let us fix a disjoint union decomposition of G into a disjoint union of H cosets now on the right hand side. So we write G as G1 times H, disjoint union with G2 times H, and so on, disjoint union with Gm times H. And in other words, we can say that we fix representatives, namely G1, G2, and so on, Gm, in all H cosets in G where H acts on the right. And our construction of induction will be given in terms of this choice of the representatives. So what is the key observation? Lemma, for any element A in G and any index I from 1 to M, there exists a unique index J, of course it depends on A and I, and this is an element from the set 1 to M, and a unique element H in H, it also depends on A and I, such that if we multiply A with our representative GI, then the outcome is the representative G with the index J of A and I times our element H, which also depends on A and I. Proof. Consider the element A times GI, which is an element in our group G. So since we have fixed our decomposition of G into a disjoint union of cosets, where H acts on the right, this element AGI belongs to a unique coset in that decomposition. So this gives us the unique index J for which the corresponding representative G with this index J lies in the same coset as AGI. And since the right action of H on the coset is free, so the stabilizer of each point is trivial, we also have a unique element H in H, again, this element depends on our A and I, such that we can write A times GI as GJ times this H. And this proves our lemma. So now we can give the definition. Let V be an H module. For each index I from one to M, consider a copy of V which we denote by GIV. So it's just a notation for the copy of V, which corresponds to the element I from 1 to M. So we will denote the elements in this copy of V by GI times V, where V is an element in V. So the vector space operations are then given as follows. They just reduce to the vector space operations in V. So GIV plus GIW is equal to GI times V plus W for V and W in V. 
and lambda times GIV is equal to GI times lambda V for any V and V and lambda a complex number. So now we define the induced module, the induced module from H to G applied to V, first as a vector space, and as a vector space, this is defined as a direct sum over all i from 1 to m, and we take the vector space G i v. So it's a direct sum of all G i v's, where i runs from 1 to m. And finally, we define the action of the group G on this vector space in the following way. For any A in G and any V in V, A acts on the vector G i V, so this is a vector in the i scope of V, in the following way. So the outcome is the vector where the marker is G with the index J of A and I, and then the, the vector after it is h sub a comma i applied to v. So let's make some comments on this definition. So we have defined the action of each element a in g only on vectors of the form g i times v. But since the induced module is a direct sum of these copies of v, so we can extend it to the whole induced module by linearity. Also, unless h is equal to g, none of the copies g i times v is a g module. And moreover, almost all of these copies are not even h modules. But there is one which is an h module, for sure. So there is a unique index i for which our representative g i is actually an element in h. And for this index i, the space GIV is an H module. In fact, this GIV is isomorphic to the original module V as an H module. So why? If you take an element H in H and apply it to the element GIV, the outcome is equal to GI times GI inverse H GI times V. But since H is in H and GI is in H, so GI inverse H GI is in H and times V, so this is a new element in V. So in particular, it follows that GIV for this particular choice of I is an H module. This means that the following diagram commutes. So we have the diagram with vertices v, v, g i v, and g i v. And in the first line, the map in the diagram is just application of the element h. So as we just described, in the second line, the map in the diagram, it sends the element g i v to the element g i times g i inverse h g i dot v. So this is how our formula prescribes the action of elements in H on this component of the induced module. So let us define the vertical lines as the linear operators which send the element V in V to the element GI times GI inverse of V in GIV. Then this diagram commutes, and in particular it follows that the vertical lines provide homomorphisms from the H module V to the H module GIV. And from the form of this homomorphism, we see that it is given using the map GI inverse, which is a bijective map, because GI is in an element of a group, which means that vertical lines are isomorphisms of H modules. So now let us check that our definition of the G module structure is correct, so that the G module structure really gives a G module. What we need to prove, we need to verify the action axiom, that given two elements A and B in G, application of AB is the same as first applying B and then applying A. So this is what we need to check. Let us compute the left-hand side. Applying A to B of GIV is by definition applying A to the element G with the index J of B comma I 
times h b comma i applied to v. This in turn is equal to g with the index j of a comma and then j of b comma i times h a comma g b comma i applied to h b comma i of v. Now we can use the action axiom for v and collect this into the following formula. So this is g with the same index j of a comma j of b comma i times and then the product of the h is h with the index a comma g of b comma i h of b comma i. So this is the left hand side. Now for the right hand side a b applied to g i of v is by definition g with the index j of a b comma i times h a b comma i applied to v. So in order to prove our claim we need to check that g with the index j of a comma g b comma i is equal to j with the index j of a b comma i and that the product of h's in the first formula is equal to the h in the second formula. And in order to check this we know that what we are really doing is that we are looking at the element a b times g i and this is an element in g so it can be uniquely written in the form g j times h for some index j and some element h. And because of the uniqueness of this form, this index j should be equal to both j of a b comma i and j of a comma j of b comma i. And the element h should be equal to both this product of two h's in the first formula and the h in the second formula. And this completes our proof. Here is an easy example. Consider the trivial subgroup H and let V be the trivial module over H with basis little v. Then H cosets are exactly the elements of G because H is a trivial subgroup, it contains just the identity. In particular, we can consider the elements of G as the unique representatives in their cosets. This means that by definition, the induced module has bases given by the elements of the form GV, where G is an element in the group G. And the action of G on this basis is given by the following formula. If we apply A to the element GV, we will get AG applied to E. So consequently, the map which sends an element G to the element GV is an isomorphism from the regular G module C of G to the induced module induction from H to G of V. So if you start from the trivial group and the trivial module and induce it up to the whole group G, you will get the regular representation of G. Here is a less trivial example. Consider as G the dihedral group D2 times 4. So here is a picture for this group. So we have R2, we have the unit circle, and we have the square in inscribed in this unit circle such that one of the vertices is the point 1, 0. And the group D2 times 4 is a group of all linear symmetries of this picture. So it consists of four rotations. We can rotate this picture in four different ways, and also four reflections. There are four axis of symmetries of this picture and we can do reflections with respect to those axes. Let H be the subgroup consisting of all rotations, so it has cardinality 4. Let R denote the counterclockwise rotation by 90 degrees. This is a generator of the subgroup H. And then the whole subgroup H consists of the identity element of R, of R squared and R cubed. Consider the defining H module V. So it's a two-dimensional module in which the action of H is given by rotation, as in the previous picture. So in other words, V is a two-dimensional complex vector space, and the action of the generating element R in the standard basis of this two-dimensional complex vector space 
is given by the matrix 0, minus 1, 1, 0. So this is because when we rotate counterclockwise, the first basis vector goes to the second basis vector, and the second basis vector goes to minus the first basis vector. So this gives us this matrix. Let us now compute the module, which is obtained by inducing this H module V all the way up to G. What does it mean to compute a module? We should determine the matrices with which some generating set for our dihedral group acts on this induced module. Let S denote the reflection in the horizontal line. So this is an element of our dihedral group. And then the whole dihedral group is actually generated by our rotation and by this reflection. So the cosets where H acts on the right in our dihedral group. So the dihedral group has eight elements and H has four elements. So we have two cosets and we can take H and SH as these cosets. So we take the identity and S as our representatives. By definition, the induced module is a direct sum of the copy EV and the copy SV. So the dimension of the induced module is of course the dimension of V, which is two, times the index of H in G, which is also two, so the dimension is four. So the elements E1 and E2 form the standard basis in our two-dimensional module V, and at the obvious basis of the induced module, we take the set EE1, EE2, SE1, and SE2. And as mentioned, G is generated by R and S, so in order to determine the induced module, we should compute the matrices of the action of these elements R and S in our basis. So how do we do the computation? Let us start with R. So we know that R times the identity element is even to the identity times R, and R times S is equal to S times R cubed. So conjugating R by S gives us R cubed. Therefore, the action of R can be computed as follows. Applying R to the basis element EE1, we know that R is equal to ER, so we get E times RE1, but RE1 is E2, so we get EE2. Similarly, REE2 is equal to ERE2, which is equal to minus EE1, because RE2 is minus E1. R times SE1 is equal to S times R cubed. E1. R cubed moves E1 to minus E2, so we will get minus S E2. And finally, R S E2 is equal to S R cubed E2. R cubed mo moves E2 to E1, so we will get S E1. And now let us do the same computation for the action of S. Note that S E is equal to S E and S times S is equal to E times E. So the action of S is then as follows. So S E times E1 is equal to S E times E1, which is S E1. S applied to E E2 is S times E E2, which is S E2. S applied to S E1 is equal to E E E1, which is equal to E E1. And S applied to S E2 is equal to E, E, E2, which is equal to E, E2. So the answer, the matrix of R is as follows. So R applied to E, E1 is E, E2. So the first column is 0, 1, 0, 0. Similarly, the second column is minus 1, 0, 0, 0. The third column is 0, 0, 0, minus 1. And the last column is 0, 0, 1, 0. So the matrix of S, so S applied to EE1 is SE1. So this is the first vector and this is the third vector. So the first column is 0, 0, 1, 0. The second column is similarly 0, 0, 0, 1. Then we have 1, 0, 0, 0. 
and 0, 1, 0, 0. This completes our example. Let us now discuss the action of induction on morphisms. Let V and W be two H modules, and let phi from V to W be a homomorphism of H modules. So we define the linear map, so the application of induction to phi, and this is a linear map from the induced module V to the induced module W, and this linear map is defined as follows. So the value of this linear map on the element of the form GIV is equal to the element GI phi of V. And this is for all V and V and for all indices I. Again, we define a linear map on elements of the form GIV, and this is extended to the whole induced module by linearity. Lemma. So this linear map is a homomorphism of G modules. Proof for any element A in G, we compute. So let us apply our linear map to the element of the form A times GI of V. Recall that AGI can be written as G with the index J of A, I times H with the index A, I. So we get the application of our linear map to the element G with this index J times this H times V. By definition, applying our map to such an element, we get G with the same index, and then we should apply phi to the element H A comma I times V. But phi was a homomorphism of H module, so we can move this H A comma I out of our phi. And again, now we have G with our index times h with our index, and we know that their product is equal to a g i. So we can rewrite this as a g i applied to phi of v. And by definition, this is exactly a applied to the image of g i v under our induced map induction from h to g of phi. This completes the proof. So this has the following consequences. First observation, if we take as V and W the same module V, and we take phi to be the identity map on V, then the induction from H to G of this identity map V gives the identity map on the induced module induction from H to G of V. This is directly by construction. The second observation, if we have three H modules V, W, and U, and we have a homomorphism phi from V to W and a homomorphism psi from W to U, so these two maps being homomorphisms of H modules, then the claim is that the induction from H to G of the composition of psi and phi is equal to the composition of first induction from H to G of phi followed by induction from H to G of psi. To prove this, let us do the following computation. Let us apply the induction from H to G of the composition of psi and phi to the element GIV. So by definition, this is GI applied to psi composition with phi applied to V. Now we can rewrite the composition of psi and phi applied to V as psi of phi of V. Now we can use the definition to write this as the image of the induction from H to G of Psi applied to the element GI of Psi of V. And now we use the definition to the argument and write it as the induction from H to G of Phi applied to GIV. And this gives us our formula. Consequently, Induction from H to G defines a functor from H mod to G mod. And the small comment, this functor is usually not full. Here is a little example. Recall our previous example where G was the dihedral group D2 times 4, H was a subgroup of all reflections, and V was the defining H module. 
So if you consider the following matrix, two, one, minus one, two, so this matrix commutes with the matrix zero minus one, one, zero, where the later matrix represent the action of the generating rotation R on V. So since R generates H, it means that two, one, minus one, two, is a matrix which defines an H endomorphism of V. Let's denote this endomorphism by phi. So then the matrix of the induced endomorphism of the induced module in the standard basis of the induced module, recall that the induced module had dimension four. So we are now talking about the four times four matrix. This matrix is then the following. So we have the matrix of phi as the first block diagonal matrix and the matrix of phi as a second block diagonal matrix. And outside this block diagonal, we have zeros. This follows directly from the definition in the previous slide. Okay, let us finish with some problems and questions. Question one, prove with all details that the restriction from G to H is isomorphic both to tensoring with the BA by module A and homing from the AB by module A. Question two, in the proof of basic property three, provide all details for the claim that sending H in H to HGI in VI defines an isomorphism from the regular H module to VI. Question three, let G be D2 times four and H be the subgroup of G generated by the reflection with respect to the vertical line and by the reflection with respect to the horizontal line. Let V be the defining H module. Compute the action of the generators of G in the natural basis of the induced module. Question four, show that the induction from H to G sends monomorphisms to monomorphisms and epimorphisms to epimorphisms. In particular, it sends isomorphisms to isomorphisms. And question five, in the example of the dihedral group considered during the lecture, check that the matrix of induction from H to G of phi commutes with the matrices, which we computed for the generators of the group G in the natural basis. Thank you very much and see you next time.